Welcome to Jim's informal open mic, where a small group of poets, and hopefully maybe eventually some non-poets, gather to share poetry. There are no featured readers for this, and depending on the size of the group, we'll read probably two and possibly three poems each, but we'll do them one at a time. So our first reader will be Kevin Walton. All righty. Um, I was just going through a couple of collections that I put together. This one's a group called Canine Consciousness. And I'm going to read the seventh poem out of that group called They Are Better Than Us. Stop me if I've read this one before. They Are Better Than Us. One chair occupied, two arms, hands sort of full, four eyes, one set open, six naturally occurring legs, four furred, Okay, mandatory belly rub concluded. So now, network entertainment bathes each intake and glance was streamed from satellite or hard wire broadcast, brightly lit, scripted just so, then thrust deftly and with no small agenda from in hive's mind to viewing sentient psyche, capturing attention, seizing moments, dulling intellect, but never quite reaching the clever canine. The human, mostly idle and allegedly entertained, gathers sloth about himself like in comfy garment, burning only those calories that in blinked eye or raised glass might burn, strapping on the snack bag between beverages, cockily awaiting some cardiac malfunction or another with devil-may-care stance, all whilst remaining stoically seated, the dog, having fruitlessly begged, now sits close, but separately, and huffs quietly. Just about at slumber's entrance, that's his bag, you know, sleep, an hour more than, than uh, half a day every day, on average, forever loyal, sneakily more aware than he looks and indifferent to network programming. He dreams of fields and chases, Pardon me. torn house slippers and drop people food. He equipped by evolution with that change of gears that'll startle and biped most times. It lodged in four legs, currently splayed akimbo and ceiling facing. Frickin' dogs, they are better than us. That's the piece. Sorry about the uh, BD beeps. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of humor in there. Have you ever seen a horse with a feed bag on? Yes. Yes, they are, they are astounding. And that mental image of a snack bag feed bag was great. <laughs> All number, right, thanks. Number two. Let me mute here. That's me. I'm going to read a hyben called Rainy Day Kala Hyben. Uh, a hyben is, as you know, a Japanese form of poetry, a prose poem with a haiku at the end. And uh, sometimes they have the haiku at the beginning, but mine's at the end. Actually, I should have called it Snowy Day Kala Haiban because it's snowing heavily outside. Probably you can see through the window. Anyway, Rainy Day Kala Haiban. It has been raining continuously for three days, but it feels like it has rained 40 days and 40 nights. An image of Noah's Ark floods my mind. I want to climb into it with my family. We are four and can enter the ark two by two, like the animals. I'm waiting for the dove with the olive branch in its beak to tell me the rain is over. My neighbor bakes kala bread every Friday, and today is Friday. Before the pandemic, we went together to the Jewish bakery to buy kala, but she's 81, and together we are afraid of the coronavirus. Some stores have run out of flour. Everyone's baking at home now. She calls me on the telephone and tells me there'll be no kala bread today, though we managed to get a bag of flour. She says she didn't feel like baking. She asks whether I'm writing something about the rain, since she knows I love writing. Come on, you can do it, she says, something in her voice as she breaks into French sporadically, since she is French-Canadian, tells me I must write about the rain. I'm glad I know French so I can understand her. I tell her I write when I'm inspired. She says she bakes when she's inspired. 
and that I'm just like her. I guess writing and baking are both an art in themselves. I post a picture of the color bread from the previous Friday on my Facebook page. The caption reads, the art of food. She is a food artist. Someday a great artist might paint a picture of the beautifully designed color bread fit for the Louvre. Noah's Ark could be drawn in the shape of the color bread. Both are symbols of peace. And here's the haiku. That sweet color bread with sweetness of love baked in. She is an artist. Thank you. Thank you. Hetty, you are number eight to read, and we are just, just finished number two. We are ready then for number three, and it looks like she's ready for us. Go ahead, Abba. Yes. I will share the screen. Go ahead. So my poem is The Story Keepers. The morning stirs and the rain slips through my bedside window, dropping gently on the ground, bringing back days of youth, of music and food to an otherwise abandoned piece of land from Rampur, a small North Indian town. It would come alive all winters, past evenings and until midnight, with lights sober and bright as the music played and the food was laid out. The musicians arrived from around the country with tunes their hearts desired, pop, light and classical. The food stalls filled with charts, kachoris and rolls, ice creams and cakes in corners. The entire town would read sons, daughters, and their parents of many generations, carrying years of rigor and fascination. The air breathed with joy, filled with aroma. All was possible and all was in doubt, as the food, music, hearts, and minds combined, bringing forth the story keepers of modern times. Untimely rains adding to belief, that all could be set right and there would still be time. Thank you. Thank you. Number four. Sorry, I was going to type her a message. I loved that line, uh, all was possible and all was in doubt. That was just, ooh, I like that one. Um, okay, so I I just finished writing with Molly Fisk. We do every other month a 30-day poem a day thing with prompts. And so these have been, I have, I'm just test driving them with you guys. So I'm going to read a couple. Uh, not this time. I'll wait for my next turn, but. Um, these are brand new things I just wrote. They might not be done, but we'll see. Um, this one's called, wait, let me get it. This one's called Immortal One. And I wish I had the photo. It was a peacock looking at himself in the mirror of a men's room. It was hilarious, but I didn't go there. I went somewhere else. <laughs> okay. So it's called, and her prompt was vanity. Thy name is vanity. Cause she gives you a verbal and a visual. And then you just go wherever you go. So, immortal one. The peacock at the Buddhist temple is anything but humble. He struts and screams of his magnificence to anyone who will listen. Flapping prayer flags cannot compete with his glorious colors. Emerald, cerulean, and glints of bronze opulent in the sun that follows him like a manservant, casting him in his best light. He weaves his way among the bamboo clumps, the eucalyptus groves, the pale upturned faces of the Japanese iris, while a holy breeze nudges the brooms of the red robed monks quietly sweeping the temple steps. Thanks. You're welcome, thank you. Nice. Number five. That's me. 
this is uh, something that's pretty new. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm having trouble. Okay. All right, it's called incognito. I look innocuous enough, hair combed, clothes calm, socks matched, nothing much to notice, body beneath clean and scented with chemical perfumes and not a hint of sweat. Quiet enough at the committee meeting with nothing to add to their agenda. All the while unnoticed behind my bland expression, I was still dancing in the arms of the great bear who comes to me in the moonlight at the foot of my bed, his scent wild as mountain fog, nestled between the rustling leaves of branches rising to cradle him in green, while I wake and lean into his heat, rest my head on his dark shoulder, bury my hand in his soft pelt, my mouth bruised by kisses deep as winter's claw as sweet and thick as honey on the tongue. Thank wow. you. Thank you. I have a quick piece to share with you just as a screen share, if I can get it out of the way of my controls. This I'm sharing only because Kavita. This is a chat book that I wrote specifically from the viewpoint of the animals and people who were um, involved with the ark story. I will share that with y'all another time. Bye. Okay. And I'm going to share this poem, screen share this with you. I was challenged to write a poem for a friend about working for himself or being self-employed. You can't fire me, says the new employee of a business that doesn't even have a name yet. Says who, asks the boss, ready to fight. Says me, says the new guy. I just started this job and I've got bills and rent to pay. Oh no, call the ambulance because I don't care. New guy says you'll care in the morning when you want something done and your brain kicks in. What the heck does that mean, smart aleck? It means you're self-employed, and without me, there's nobody to actually do the work. Ten minutes of silence ensue, while the man who doesn't care about anyone else tries to figure out if that means he also doesn't care about his new worker himself and how either of them is getting paid. In the end, he decides that running his own shop is too much of a hassle and no days off. Last I heard, he'd found a job at the DMV where he was named Employee of the Year. So there's my take on being self-employed. Sterling, you're up, number seven. Mute. Okay, for today, uh, within this hour or something, I have a couple of pieces uh, that are going to be published in the next couple of days. Uh, and the first piece I want to, uh, or for this tur turn, I'm going to read one. Actually, I think I, I um, initially, uh, no, it's not that one. I initially um, submitted it to uh, uh, to Jim and got different ones accepted so then i decided wait a minute i don't like the form anyway so i rewrote it into a fibonacci uh and it'll be out in the fib review uh tomorrow so it's called dongze fibonacci i feel like an s neck black swan dusting feathers with ice flakes, allowing wind gusts to carry flurries that settle on wings, much like a sub-zero mantle worn loosely over plumes. 
storm clouds clear, mist rises, winter solstice fog dissolves like steamy vapor that parts night skies, and stars hang like jewels twinkling, glittering from black swan to astronomer, and I wait and watch orbs scintillate red green and blue, like bright nightclub mirror balls, bathing nude dancers under spotlights, as fleeting as snowfall fluff that melts the minute it hits the earth. Thanks for listening. Thanks for sharing. That brings us to number eight. We love that you're excited, but you're also muted. Yes, I'm excited silently. I was saying, can I share screen? And uh, uh, we're reading one or two poems. I can't hear you, Jim. That's because I was muted. <laughs> one, one poem, and then we're going to go around again for a second. Okay, so I will share screen. I'll read the... First, uh, uh, a poem uh, from my new ecrastic collection, or did you ever see the other side? And this is a painting by a Czechoslovakian um, a Czech uh, artist. It's titled, oh, I made a spelling mistake on white here. I have to add the, the H. Oh, la la, what did I do? I can't fix it now. It's supposed to be White Ophelia. Voila. White Ophelia by Joanna Smilowska. And this is the poem that I've written. Or what if she'd chosen to drown in a river of down? Some want to drown in their dreams or in amber drink, others in denial whilst he thinks of a river of clouds sweeping her high above, sinks in a river of down, suffocating without wetting her auburn curls. Yes, vanity still prevails in such moments. Is there something worth dying for, she wonders? But maybe, just maybe, if you live long enough, you may cross the threshold of desire, its constantly deferred lack, learn to yearn for sunshine, await the concert of birds. Once upon the time, tempests took hold of her heart. Chest tight, she withheld her tears, realized she was never asked, what do you really want? And removed the veil off her face. There comes a time when ashes become so cold you can no longer remember a fire was ever started. There comes a time when you know you've lost your moisture and you dream of drowning, even drowning should be dry. There are some delightful lines in that. I think I, at the beginning on the first stanza, it should be whilst she thinks of a river. I noticed it when I read. All right. Thank you. So I'll stop share. And we are back to Mr. Chillax, number one. Ready for a second poem from you. There, just unmuting. Hi. Um, wow, I've listened to some good poems. I got mesmerized in listening to some of those things. Jim, um, you inspired me with your poem about the employee of the year there. I, I may have read this one before, but I'm going to read it again anyway, called What Are You Reporting? Uh, about a civil servant that I know pretty closely um, from a time way back when. What are you reporting? He shows three fingers the index, the metal, and the ring, and in gesture meant to measure out his liquor from a distance, to who pours it from a greenish bottle of off-brand rot gut swill, and in quiet, darkened space, adorned mostly with dust and dead insects, 
preserved dryly in sills of three alley facing windows, unopened since the Carter administration. No need to disturb that historic air with any ventilation, he muses, absently fingering the rim of an spotty glass before downing its contents and signaling another's delivery. Reflecting briefly between these activations of his coping mechanism, he checks his wrist for and watches report and curses, fuck, I'm late, before hurriedly paying his tab and tip while in motion toward an street side door, toting a small soft sided leather bag by one of its two handles, only slightly sauced. He recalls the mandatory mouthwash and breath mint, returning an quarter hour late for waiting work and stairs. He is numb to their scathing, silent commentary, fumbling to remove a corded headset from his bag. He plugs into an lit radio console in a mostly darkened bay of identical workstations, immediately answering the incoming call. Police dispatch. This is operator 123. What are you reporting? That's the piece. <laughs> Zing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Number two. Kavita, you're up. Um, so I'm going to read um, Psalm 121 the modern version after the original Psalm 121. And um, I just wanted to say that uh, I worked in the mountains in a mountain town for 16 years, nestled in the foothills of the Himalayas. So the mountains were always a, a backdrop to my life, but um, I did love all of the Psalms right all the way through school. So this is Psalm 121, the modern version. I lift up my hands to the heavens from whence a loaf of kala bread descends. Manna for my hungry soul, I will not complain. My help comes from the one who made the mountains. He knows I have weak ha ankles and helps me climb. He does not sleep, watches till I have safely reached the top. He protects me from the bear and the panther. He makes sure the sun does not blind me, nor the moonlight that enters the room, my sleep disturb. He protects me from negative energies. He preserves the purity of my being. He girds me as I leave the house, dressed suitably for winter in hats, coat and mitts and return home without slipping or falling to a home warmed by a working furnace. Thank you. Thank you. I like that interpretation. Thank you. Number three. Yes. I'll share the screen. Yes. The lives we hold. I learned to drive at the age of 35. A commendable feat considering what it means to be on the Indian roads. Free from bus queues, struggles of the right, and negotiating to alight, I was now delightfully on the move. Before long, I began to miss the way bus would crawl through the potholes, each one of us clutching the bars above, the seat handles in front or the shoulder next to us. The view from a high point akin to being on top of a mountain and a place of virtue. The way the bus could throw the three wheelers and racing motorbikes, of course. Riding on top of each other, we could smell the soaps used. It was not the landscape alone that was lost, but the faces on the footpaths, the little eateries on the bylanes, that offered snacks and tea in an attempt to stay the time momentary. The bonds invisible at first from those hours in the bus, irrespective of origin, upbringing and reach. The burden of carrying ranged from designer wallets to cloth bags, each one of us learning to cope with what we were offered. Today, when I pass in my car, a bus tilting with weight, faces pressed against the glass, hands holding the bars, 
feet playing the balancing game, I am reminded of the lives we held then. Thank you. I like that perspective. <laughs> I, have never, I haven't ever lived in a place that has a lot of public transit. So that is not something that uh, I would have noticed. Yes, it is really different. And in on Indian roads and when the buses are totally jam-packed, you, you really get to see a lot inside and outside as well. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Number four. Once more. Hi again. I love that poem, by the way. Thank you for that. I'm a I was a bus rider for years in multiple cities. So even though it wasn't India, I could totally relate to that. Okay. So this one is another one of the Molly poems. And I'm thinking we're all old enough to know that movie, The King and I. Please say yes, because otherwise you might not understand this one. Okay. All right. So when I was in sixth grade, my teacher uh, put up, she assembled us as a class and put a play on for the whole school of that. And I was Anna. So this is kind of a preface to that. All right. It's called One, Two, Three, And. We're in the cafeteria, Jimmy and I, learning how to polka. Not just polka, but sing at the same time. Much harder than the whistle, the happy tune number, where, where all I had to do was stroll around the make-believe ship deck singing with Roger, my ersat son. Except for the whistling part, that part was hard. I don't know how I would have gotten through sixth grade if it weren't for Miss Costello. I can't even tell you what I learned that year the year my father left us to fend for ourselves with our mother. But she pulled it off, putting on that play for the whole school. How she shepherded us in all our confusion and brokenness, all our sixth graderness. She took everyone's strengths, everyone's talents, and gave them a job, gave them back to themselves. Like Roger, one test away from special ed, Jody, so shy she went scarlet when called on. Chris, who came to school dirty and hungry, but always knew the answer. And Jimmy, the angry son of a drug dealer, holding the hand of a sad little girl. Shall we dance? Thanks. Well done. Thanks. It was the last one we wrote. She gave us a, a bleep year prompt, and that was what I got. So Excellent. thank you. Number five. Don't forget to unmute. Who's five? Did we I seem to have lost the whole thing. We can still hear you. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. I'm I'm using my phone and it's just Okay, this is, I hope I haven't read this one to you before. It's called Unfit, and it's actually a necrastic uh, poem that was based on a um, Hausa, that's an African group, uh, bird headdress. It's made out of wood and bronze and all kinds of uh, feathers and stuff. She was an acre of tinder waiting for the match would set her hair on fire and slap it out fast, a dramatic dare and rescue the wrong side of saying. Followed by the smell of burning, she marked everything she touched with fingerprints of ash. She walked the alleys for hours. Those years, most drinks came in glass bottles, and every one she found she swung hard and threw against a wall to hear it smash. No one saw or stopped her, and she left behind a trail of broken glass. Trees spoke to her the way they speak to the deaf in gestures and with the shapes of shadow and light splintering the air. 
She knew each one she passed by its secret name, the path pack sap took from root to leaf, the way fog rested like a scarf around its shoulders, the way each day was a slow step in its long dance, the way they forgave her with new greens after each long winter's freeze. She had no guardian angel but a great bird, a shadow falling like an owl, silent and dark, swift and accurate as any raptor claw and beak and the hush of air coming down clean as a knife. Even with that fierce eye, she was more crow than owl or eagle, no diva but a canny scavenger polishing her darks in the sun, voice of raw caw, neither the gull's bold squawk nor the long, soft grief of the dove, her voice unfit for words in any language but the one she invented to speak to herself. Arms spread like wings, she wore her fury like a crown, a totem, a warning, a bird whose silent scream could turn men's bones to sand, leaving her there at last, a queen, triumphant and alone. Thank you. Thank you. I don't remember hearing that before. And I think that it would be lovely to have that in verse virtual. Oh, even, oh, yeah, okay. That would be great. <laughs> and you know, I'm, I'm going to be posting March's issue tonight. So subs will open tomorrow for April. Yeah, I think April, I can't go before April because I was in, was I in February or January? I can't remember. I think January. Okay. If you were in January, that's February, March, April. You can April would be good. Yep. We people okay. words are so number challenged. <laughs> <laughs> but if that's a problem, I can look it up for you. I'm going to take a break for just a second and welcome James Keene. Happy to have you join us. I'm assigning you number nine as a reader. And we've, um, we're on me number six for the second round. So when we get to number nine, Jim, we're going to have you read two poems. And at that point, if we still have time, we're going to go back around again. We'll, we'll try to end maybe with a short one from each. So I'm it. I'm number six. Sometimes when you live in a neighborhood where there are things closer to you than you would like, it makes life interesting because there are smells. And this poem is called Living Downwind from a Fast Food Place. My morning cereal, no matter what kind, smells of breakfast burritos, sausage, hash browns, perfectly round fried eggs, and commercial coffee black, stale, not a normal thing for cornflakes. Lunch on the days I am home fares no better. My peanut butter and grape jelly sandwich has overtones of greasy burgers and cheese, French fries, onion rings, even hot pickles, and sometimes a hint of thinly sliced bacon right there in the middle of my meal. Dinner, I've all but given up hope. I've all but given up hoping to taste my ramen, spaghetti, chef salad, or tuna. Every one is diluted by the wind-borne odors of cooking oil, heated all day, worn out from the fries, the fish, the cheap tacos, worn out from the breaded chicken strips that followed all the other foods, no chance to change midday. Dessert, I've abandoned completely. I mean, who wants ice cream that smells like corn dogs, chalupas, or churros? And the worst part of it all is that the darn fast food joints are open 24 hours a day. 24 stinking hours. I can't even enjoy a simple midnight snack. Thank you. That brings us to number seven. Okay, uh, I want to read a poem that uh, it's possible I could have read it before. It's uh, going to be uh, appearing in the next day or so in the Frisiactic, uh Review. And um, 
The title of the poem is called Night Children. Primeval twilight cultivates diverse spirits, tiger stripes, orphans, Aravelli range wolf packs, foster feral girls and boys, abandoned by city dwellers, embraced by canid surrogates that nuzzle orphan babes, comfort flailing arms, warm bare feet, and sing hairless, naive pups asleep. Wild jungle youngsters walk upon four limbs like paws, knees and elbows scarred. Innocence untamed howl at the moon, join furry brethren wailing, growling, celebrating until early dawn symphony hushes the lupine choir, which shifts its attention to nurturing foundlings, tutoring young mowglies, to hunt and play. Spiritual lichens welcome the lunar allure, brave transformation. Very good. Number eight. Sound. Sorry, it's me, uh, right? Right, it's you. Okay, um, I'll share screen then. Um, this is um, a poem I have written uh, not too long ago. Eddie? It's, yeah. That looks like a hugely long piece. Okay, okay, well, I'll skip and read another one. Thank you. So okay. I want to make sure we have time for a third. Uh, yeah, I didn't realize how, how large it was. Um, this one also has been uh, has been written recently and was published by Jaker Press a couple of months ago or so. So this is a pentoum and it's titled How Do We Manage to Store Our Parallel Worlds? Do not fear entering the dark woods where silence prevails. Through this passage, we replenish and heal ourselves. Under every imposing tree, seemingly reeking of strength, under layers of growth, a hidden heartwood is shaken. Through this passage, we replenish and heal ourselves. We've learned to bear so many trials unknown to our children. Under layers of growth, a hidden heartwood is shaken. We suppressed and buried scenes that still revisit us in dreams. We've learned to bear so many trials unknown to our children. Insidious bubbles open up to parallel worlds we once owned. We suppressed and buried scenes that still revisit us in dreams. Haggard faces with empty looks, lips spitting, piercing words. Insidious bubbles open up to parallel worlds we once owned. We keep our jinns and afrits subdued into shrunken episodes. Haggard faces with empty looks, lips spitting piercing words, just paper burns into smoke swirls, chasing restless shadows. We keep our jeans and our frites subdued into shrunken episodes, stored in swollen joints the way tree burls respond to stress. Just paper burns into smoke swirls, chasing restless Shadows stacked in barks, cracks, crevices, engraved in hermetic script. I like that. Thank you. I know I know gens, but what is an afrit? 
It's the same. It's uh, Afrit is like uh, spirits, sprites, and uh, jinns also. Uh, okay. Magical, uh, uh, little like the Irish goblins and little uh, creatures from uh, the Thousand and One Nights. And, uh, okay. Thank you. You're most welcome. Next up is Jim Keen. And I'm going to have you read two because you weren't here for your first round. Well, that's my punishment. <laughs> that is that is our delight and your punishment. Oh, good. I I always I feel like someone who got thrust on stage, and you know now. What? Um, anyway, I'd like to read a, a poem. I think this I, I might have put this one in. Uh, was I guess was the January uh, issue of Verse Virtual, but I it, it means a lot to me. Uh, it's a uh, memory of seeing a uh, slow train of wheelchairs heading up the road in Hunter with uh, severely handicapped teenagers. Um, I never forgot it. And um, it, does that this, does that sound familiar to you, Jim, or, or no? It's, no? Not really. It probably okay. should, but then I have an old man's memory. Well, <laughs> you and me both. Um, okay, so, and this is, uh, they came from Camp Jeanette. It's a very famous um, camp for the severely handicapped that closed in 2009. Uh, it was on the. It was the subject of a documentary called Crip, Crip Camp, which I had the pleasure of seeing, privilege of seeing about two or three years ago, and I would urge you to see it. Uh, they were instrumental in bringing a lot of the legislation and and things that you have for the the um, the. Uh, uh, is the word crippled? I don't know. I don't want to use the word crippled, but you know, that need all, all the, the ramps we see and all the safety measures that they have now. And it was through their actions that they, these things were made. So anyway, this is called Unforgotten in Memory of Camp Jeanette, 1951 to 2009. Here comes a rolling train, the like I've never seen before. The slowness of its movement captivates six cars to this train. No engine, no caboose, but six strong engineers, one behind each passenger. The passengers lay back, silent prisoners in leg irons, arms stiffly dangling, useless to be bound. The engineers tend with murmured singing of ice cream, of sodas, but a candy bar? Ever? No. Lead prisoner. You never move your face, eyes unblinking, fixed on me, but rolling past slowly, all the while. Your open mouth sags forever in a wan smile. Excellent description of a world most of us don't live in. Well, I, 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 it was many years ago. I, I was working up in Hunter uh, in my years of my college years and summers. And um, they were going up the road towards the local eatery and, you know, hang out. And I remember reading, I guess I talked to one of the um, counselors later and I said, well, how can, he said, well, they can do so, soft ice cream and sodas. I said, but no candy bars. I said, no, they can't swallow. So I, I've had two serious surgeries within six months. And this is a reminder that, you know, as serious as they were, they were rectifiable, the conditions. These people had no such option. And amazing. Never forgot them. Um, another one had a poem called Mother and Son, um, which was, uh, we just celebrated my, my, son's 31st birthday. He came to us from El Salvador when he was two months shy of two. So <laughs> where did the time go? Um, and uh, I recall, I saw pictures of my wife and he kind of frolicking in uh, the Jersey uh, waters of uh, uh, Seaside Heights. And I thought it, it brought me back to the, to the day, to the night at Newark airport years ago that I Welcome them off the plane after two out two two flights to get back to Newark, and um, 
And it brought back that memories. So basically I'm celebrating that called Mother and Son. Radiant with exhaustion, but never staggering off the second flight of that long blessed night. Hugging to fitful sleep, a dark eyed little boy, so safely cocooned in the jumpsuit you clothed him in against the cold he never suffered where he was born. Here you are at last, mother and son. Your love that never stops growing, deepening, already begun. You couldn't wait for me to hold him high, face to face, eyes to eyes, a baby in a photograph no longer. Nicholas, my son, long since grown to Nick, it was then that I knew, and after all our years together, it still holds true. I was the lucky one. It's a wonderful thing to recognize how lucky we are. Okay, it's 517 and I have to go at 530. So I think what I will do is we will stop the reading. I'll turn off the recording, but we can go ahead and visit for another 10 minutes or so.